From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Father Taggart. I'm calling you from Ossining. I'm one of the chaplains here at Sing Sing. Oh, yes, sir. What can I do for you, Father? Well, nothing for me, Mr. Dollar, but possibly for someone else. Michael Cairn, one of our inmates, asked me to contact you. Michael Cairn? Mm-hmm. You remember him? He wasn't sure you would. Old-time grifter and con man who got tied up with an insurance fraud a few years ago, blonde fella? Yes. Well, Michael wants to see you, Mr. Dollar. Did you possibly find the time to come up here? Oh, well, I don't know, Father. Is this something important? It is to Michael. Oh, well, uh, look, I'll be in New York sometime next month. Maybe I'll get a chance to stop off. Well, couldn't you possibly make it sooner? What's the rush? He's going to be there quite a while, isn't he? Not very long, I'm afraid. Michael is dying. All right, Father, you can expect me. Welcome to Johnny Dollar. Beginning tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Allied Casualty and Insurance Company Limited, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Ed Barth, Controller's Office. This is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McCormick matter. Though you didn't authorize the investigation, Ed, I'm sure that once the facts are out, you will honor the following. Expense account, item one, seven dollars and ninety-five cents. Train fare and incidentals, Hartford to Austin, New York. I was admitted inside the prison and greeted by Father Tackett. He's a tall, mild-looking man, a Jesuit, I believe. He had a pass all ready for me, and he led me straight to the prison infirmary. Just in here. Michael will certainly appreciate your coming, Mr. Dollar. I hope it satisfies whatever's on his mind. I can't imagine what it would be. You know, it was my investigation and testimony that put him in here, Father. He told me all about that. I'm sure it has nothing to do with why he wants to see you. See, his lungs started to go about two years ago, and there's just been no way to arrest the condition. Does he know how close he is? So he is, and he's not afraid to die. Here we are, Mr. Dollar. Oh. What? Part of the same man I remember, Father. He's had it bad lately. Lost a great deal of weight. Yeah. Asleep? Yes. Michael. Michael! Oh. Hey, Father. I brought someone to see you. What do you say? Hiya, Mike. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thanks, Johnny. Thank Father Taggart here. Uh, he's an all right guy, John. He's just like you. I always said you were the best insurance cop. <laughs> here, here, what's all this? I'm kicking out, Johnny. Didn't you tell him, Father? He told me, Mike. <laughs> Guess I didn't live right. I'll be back in a little while. Thanks, Father. You take it easy, Mike. <laughs> yeah, lousy place to die, prison. But I ain't got my choice. Thanks to you. Well, it's just that you picked to do a couple of things that the law and some insurance companies didn't agree with, Mike. Uh, I don't hold none of that against you. The guy does what he does. I, I don't know how to tell you this. <laughs> Maybe I better get the doctor. You shouldn't be talking so much. No, oh, no, wait. Johnny, look, you know I'm no crybaby. When the doctor gave me the news, uh, I got to thinking. I ain't scared to blow out, you understand? I know, Mike, I know. You know it's just that... I had a wife once, long time ago when I started out. Oh? Yeah. Then I just kind of drifted out of her picture one day and... <laughs> you got a cough drop, baby. <laughs> yeah, I guess she wouldn't care what I got. Anyhow, I, I got to do something for her before I... Well, Johnny, I lay here and I get myself an idea. Yeah, much? Johnny, if there was some really easy money lying around... Would you pick it up for me? Depends on how clean it is, Mike, and where it's lying. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But it, it, it's clean, all right. You can find that out for yourself. All right. Now, now listen. Till they moved me down here in the infirmary, I roomed upstairs with Jojo Panny. You know him? No, I don't believe I do. And Carthage from the Hay States. He got his sabbatical three weeks ago. Paroled. Uh-huh. Well, I've been in the camp with a lot of guys, but Jojo Penny <laughs> kicks the cage. He's got a little old five-year trick to put in. <laughs> the 
this Jojo, he doesn't like a vacation. You know, a little picnic. Every time he gets a chance out in the yard, he's taking sun. So don't get the color, see? Yeah. Uh, uh, <coughs> when they push him in with me, I notice this. And I get to going over it in my head. Yeah. Why does a guy whistle in a cell block, Johnny? Why, why is he treating it like a rest home? He's got something outside waiting. Uh, that's it, baby. He's got something waiting for him outside. Something that he knows will keep safe. Money. Thought you said this was legitimate, Mike. It is, it is. Now, wait. I didn't ask Jojo anything about this. No, I figured it out myself. Then a couple of times I hear him yelling in his sleep. McCormick, he yells. McCormick. Eh? Makes sense now, Johnny? Not yet. Ah, the big heist, Johnny, the big heist. A few years ago, a rich guy named McCormick out on Long Island or someplace like that gets turned over for a hundred thousand dollars worth of jewelry. You remember? Vaguely. Yeah, well, I'm thinking that Jojo Panny was in on it somewhere. Hmm. Else why would he be singing and whistling and chilling himself around this fly trap for five years? Else why would he be talking about that when he's sleeping? McCormick. McCormick. Yeah. Maybe you've got something, Mike. Ah, I know I got something, Johnny. And you got something, too. It... <laughs> oh, no, Mike. Take it easy. Oh, I'm all right. I'm all right. Don't you see? The insurance company must have a reward out. They always do. A reward. Yeah, but Mike... Look. I tell you, Joe Joe is the ginzo that done the job. Or he knows who did it. So, you look into it. Work on it. Maybe turn up the stuff and get the reward. Good clean coin. Yeah. Yeah. Send half of it to my old lady, will you? You keep the rest yourself. What'd you say? Huh? Will you... My turn died three hours later. It was wake at me. Item two, fourteen dollars and twenty cents. Train fare and incidentals, Austin to New York. I arrived at two fifteen, dropped my bag off at the New Western, and went over to the Metropolitan Police Station to find out what I could about the McCormick matter. It was all pretty much as old Mike had told me. A Julian McCormick living on Long Island had suffered a $100,000 jewelry burglary in 1951. Twelve suspects had been arrested and released. The case was marked open and unsolved. Allied Casualty had been the insurance company involved. This is the adjustment office. Frank Porter speaking. My name's Johnny Dollar, Mr. Porter. I'm an investigator. Oh, I think I've heard of you, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Wonder if you could give me a little information about a claim your company handled in 1951. A man named Julian McCormick out on Long Island. Gee whiz, long time ago. Uh, what about the McCormick claim? I might have some information on it. I don't know yet. It's a long chance. I'm at police headquarters, and I notice you investigated for the insurance company. I'd like to talk to you. Well, yeah, sure, but it's kind of late today. Tomorrow, okay? Well, you can tell me this right now. Is there any reward being offered? Gee whiz, kind of falls my sales. How's that? Well, asking about a reward. You sound like you can make full recovery and want to make sure that you'll be paid for it. Well, I said it was just a long shot. How about the reward? Well, that's pretty standard with us on cases like this. Yeah, I think it's 7500 or something like that. I'm not sure. Where are you staying? New Weston. Well, I'll look it up, get the exact figure, and call you there. How'll that be? Fine, thanks. That'll be fine. Before I left the police station, I turned out a mug on Jojo Panning. He was a big, broad-shouldered lad with plenty of beef and a list of petty convictions, four of them in New York State. The last one was for carrying concealed weapons. His parole status was good, though, and the parole officer furnished me with his home address. The Allen Hotel, right? Stay week a month, 115th Street. It's open, it's open. Come on in. Hiya. Looking for Joe Pant. Yes, sir. That's me. My name's Johnny Dollar. Yeah? I, uh... I just came down from Austin. I saw a friend of yours up there, Joe. Who was that? Mike Cairn. How's Mike? Not so good. He died today. Uh, it's too bad. He was a nice old coot. Kind of liked him. Said if I ever saw you to say hello. Uh-huh. 
He didn't give you my address. No, I got it from the parole office. You some kind of cop? No, I work for an insurance company. Oh. Buy you a drink? Sure. Why not? Expense account item three, four dollars even for drinks. I wanted to look at Joe Joe Panny and talk to him and figure out how I was going to go about getting information from him. And the more I saw and the more he talked, the more I wondered if whatever he might have said about the McCormick case in his sleep happened to some other McCormick. After all, a man with a long list of petty thieveries is hardly ever involved in a slick, big-time safe-cracking job. That takes another kind of talent, and one I was sure that JoJo didn't have. So I've just been taking it easy and looking around. I figure I can get a job pushing a truck or maybe a cab if I'm lucky. Got to get something to do. Parole officers kind of hard-nosed about things like that. Yeah. Drink up. Want one more? Oh, no, no thanks. Please my limit. Like to keep in shape. Sure. Say, uh, you got anything to do? Nothing special. Why? Thought I might go out to Long Island later on tonight to say hello to an old friend of mine. If you haven't got anything to do, come on along. <laughs> You're okay, bub. Sure, why not? Uh, this friend of yours, he's an ex-con too? No, he never did any time. Just a friend. Want to say hello is all. Oh. Rich fella. His name's Julian McCormick. You're uh, very big with the hellos around here today, aren't you? Anything wrong, Joe? You probably are. Why do you say that? Nothing. Ever know anyone named McCormick? I knew a guy named Arnie McCormick once back in Salt Lake City. We were pals for a while. Oh. Yeah. Arnie was killed in the war. He got himself drafted in the infantry. Maybe he's related to my friend Julian McCormick out on Long Island. He wasn't related to anybody, not that bird. I'm leaving. I want to get up early tomorrow. Why not come with me? <laughs> Thanks for the drinks. He drifted off down the street and left me standing there. And one thing I was sure of, he had the name McCormick on his mind. Whether it was the right McCormick or the right case, I didn't know. Anyhow, he was my one big lead. So I was back at his hotel early the next morning and talking to the desk clerk. Annie, did you say room 210? Yeah, that's right. The moose. What? He left bag and baggage last night. Well, where did he go? What's his forwarding address? He didn't say. Just left. <laughs> Here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Thanks. Tomorrow, there's living proof that a pretty girl can be just as dangerous as a pretty girl. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. It's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Uh, this is Frank Porter, Allied Casualty. Yes, Mr. Porter. Well, call me Frank, Johnny. Uh, you phoned yesterday about the McCormick matter. I got all the stuff about the case on my desk here. 
Uh, we're still offering $7,500 reward. Thanks for confirming it, Frank. Sure. Uh, you got a tip or something? An old con named Mike Cairn gave me a tip about a guy named Jojo Panny. I'm working on it. Need any help? No, not yet. I might. Jojo pulled out of his hotel last night, bag and baggage. Hmm. What are you going to do? I'm on my way to Long Island. Huh? I want to talk to McCormick himself. Oh. Uh, Johnny. Yeah? Let me give you a tip for your own good. Don't bother Julian McCormick unless you've really got something. Could be dangerous. I think I've got something. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Allied Casualty and Insurance Company Limited, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McCormick matter. Item four, $10 deposit on the car I rented to drive out to Julian McCormick's home on Long Island. And judging by the looks of the place, a safe full of $100,000 worth of jewelry would feel right at home. It was a mansion, and the rugs on the floor were an inch thick. I'm sorry I've kept you waiting. Mrs. McCormick and I were packing for a little trip to Europe. Sit down, please. Thanks. Going to be gone long? Oh, we usually spend several months a year over there. We're a bit late this year. Our reservations are for next week. I envy you, Mr. McCormick. Dollar the name? That's right. Forgive me, but I don't seem to recall having heard of you before. Oh, it's okay. We never met. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh, really? Am I being investigated or something? No, 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 nothing like that. It's just that I might have a lead on that jewelry that was taken from your home a few years ago. Well, that's wonderful. You must tell me about it. Can I make you a drink? No, thanks. You're from the insurance company. Allied casualty? No, no, I'm not. I'm an independent investigator. Well, why should anyone feel it necessary to call in a... Oh. Oh, I see. There's a reward, of course. That's right. Yes, of course. But now, tell me. How can I help you? Well, I'm just checking a few things, Mr. McCormick. I haven't even gone over it with a man who handled a case for Allied. Possibly I have run into something that'll help. I don't know. I'd like you to tell me what happened. My safe was opened and my jewelry taken. I mean, how it happened. Well, it was right in this very room. That's the wall safe there. Uh Uh-huh. Mrs. McCormick and I had just returned from our honeymoon. Five years ago, it was. Yeah? Yeah. All I know is that when I stepped into the library here that morning, the safe was open and everything was gone. Whoever did it was extremely clever and quiet, I must say. Was the safe cracked? No, no, no. It was just open. Someone figured the combination or something like that. Well, who knew the combination at the time? Only myself, Mr. Dollar. You're sure of that? Why, of course. I see. I reported it to the police right away here on Long Island, then some men from New York City were here, too. And your insurance company? I reported it to my insurance company immediately. They had a man on the scene as soon as the police. A uh, Mr. Porter. Frank Porter? Yes. Do you know him? I've talked to him on the phone. I haven't met him. A very nice chap. He worked very hard trying to recover it. I'm sure he did. Did they have an adjuster? Yes. Uh, how much did you collect, if you don't mind? Not much. What do you mean? Well, it was unfortunate. By keeping that much jewelry in a small house safe, it seems I violated a clause in the contract. It should have been kept in a safety deposit box or some such. Consequently, the matter went into litigation. I'm afraid the court found me at fault. I collected only a part of the insured value, $20,000. So, you can see, I certainly welcome the recovery. Sure. The jewelry was in the family a good many years. I had given it to my wife, and I... Well, a man hates to lose things he loves. Yes, I understand. Was Mrs. McCormick here the morning it happened? Oh, yeah? I'd like to talk to her. She's terribly busy, but if you think it's sufficiently important, I'll call her. No, never mind. I'm curious, Mr. Dollar. This case has been closed a long time. At least, no one's contacted me or asked me for any information about it for at least four years. 
What opened it? A man named Mike Cairn. Huh? Who's he? An old convict up at Ossining who shared a cell for a while with a man named Joe Panny. Uh Uh-huh. Cairn died yesterday. But before he died, he told me he thought Panny had something to do with it. He'd heard him mention your name. Well, it seems to me you should talk with this Joe Panny. I did. And I will some more. As soon as I locate him again. Right now he's missing. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, thanks for the time, Mr. McCormick. You let me know if you learn anything? Sure. Do you honestly think you can recover that jewelry? With any luck at all. It would be wonderful. Wonderful. You think so? Why, yes, of course. Mrs. McCormick might be glad to know about it, too. Huh? You said it was her jewelry. I don't know why I said that to him. Just a sudden impulse. But he wasn't smiling when he walked me to the door, shook my hand, and patted me on the shoulder. I had a funny feeling that Mr. Julian McCormick was scared like a rabbit of me. I drove back to the city, had lunch at Walgreens, and dropped into Allied Casualties' New York office to pick up the folder on reward information. I met Frank Porter and liked him right away, a big red-headed man in a tweed suit. Gee, where, Johnny? It makes me feel older than ever doing this. How come? Well, I weighed 15 pounds less when this case started. June, 1931. Ah, here we are. Uh, these are pictures of the stuff. Uh-huh. Now, that one they call Tierra del Fuego. Huh? Some necklace, hmm? Might see why. Yeah, and uh, this one was called Imperial. In the royal family of Russia at one time. And uh, this is the other one. Placid. Beautiful stuff. Oh, you can say that again. That all of them? Well, that's about the size of it, Johnny. One hundred thousand dollars gone. Yeah. Help any? Sure. It's nice to know what I'm trying to find. Well, I hope you have better luck than I did. Yeah. Say, uh, who was the police officer on that case? Uh, Martin. Duels Martin. Out of Central? Yeah. We ran down every lead we could find, big and small. The file said you made 12 arrests. Yeah, something like that, but not one of them panned out. Had to let them all go. Martin requested pickups on every big-time jewelry man in the country. Now, I don't think one of them was overlooked. Well... No, Johnny, somebody just simply walked in that house, opened the safe as neat as you please, and walked right out with all of this. Very slick job. Had to be an experienced man. Well, might have been a first job for someone just starting in, and he got lucky. Yeah, we thought of that, and we didn't think much of it after a while. Thank you. Gee whiz, Johnny, you know, nobody could be that lucky. Chase the house, know exactly where the safe was, know what was in it, get in, open it up, and get out without anybody, servants, the McCormicks, or any of their friends even seeing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that wasn't even the hardest part, you see. Not one scrap of this stuff has ever turned up anywhere. Yeah. Well, anywhere. Now, what did, what did whoever took it do with it? Did he break it down, sell it overseas? What? Not a trace of it. Imagine that. Imagine. You know what I think? I think the guy who swiped all this stuff still has it. I think he's sitting around waiting for it to cool off. Could be. Uh... But it's never going to cool off, Johnny. There isn't a city in this country or across the ocean that isn't on the lookout for these pieces. I suppose. Now, sooner or later, hot boy or lucky boy, well, whoever he is, will make a move. <laughs> Meantime, we just wait. Unless, of course, uh, you've got something for us to look into. Uh, not yet, Frank. Yeah. Well, when you have, we'll be right with you all the way. Good, good. How about a drink? Uh, take a rain, sir. Okay. But remember, we got a whole floor full of lawyers upstairs. They can get up warrants, writs, seizure orders, anything you might want. Yeah. You just let me know when you get somewhere and we'll go to work. I'll do that, Frank. I left Frank Porter and went back over to the poll office to see what had developed with Joe Panning. After all, if he didn't report in, he'd be in violation of his parole, be in real trouble. But nothing had developed. He hadn't put in a change of address, nothing. So I went back to my hotel and had some dinner. Then I shaved, changed my clothes. Expense account, item five, dollar and a half, cab fare. I garaged my rented car, went back to Central Police Station and pulled out the mug on Joe Panny once more, hoping to get a line on some friends or relatives of his where he might be staying. Up till then, things had been going pretty routine. Then a clerk from the parole offices stepped across the hall. Hi, Mr. Dollar. Hi. Thought it was you I saw in here. I wasn't sure. How's it going? Fine, fine. Talked to your friend Joe Joe Panny yet? Not today. Why? You seemed awful anxious to talk to him, is all. I am. Why don't you go see him? You playing games? I've been trying to find out where he is all day. And I already told you. You what? Sure, I gave it to you half an hour ago when you phoned. When who phoned? Sure, about half an hour ago. 
Look, Joe Panny call in and told me his address. Yeah? I no sooner set down a phone and you call in and said, this is Johnny Dollar. Have you heard from Joe Panny? What? I said, yeah, and I told you his address. That's all. What address did you say? The Allen Hotel on 115th Street. Same place he was before. What's the matter? You forget? It took me ten minutes to get from the police station over to the Allen Hotel. Ten minutes of wondering who'd put in that call and used my name. I went up the stairs, two at a time, up to the second floor. And right at the top of the landing, I bumped into a dark-haired woman wearing a silver fur. Oh! Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't see you. It's all right. You hurt? No, not at all. Please, let me go past. I'm in a hurry. Yeah, I'd be in a hurry, too. What do you mean? The gun. What? You should carry it on the inside of your purse. Oh, I didn't... Suppose I take it. No, let go of me. You... Bring it, Ailsa. Give it to me. All right, take it. She'd given it to him, all right, right on the side of the head. It didn't knock me out, but it did knock me off balance, so I tangled up at the hall table. And that gave her plenty of time to scurry down the stairs while I got out of the furniture and back on my feet. By the time I got down the stairs and out on the street, she was nowhere in sight. Hmm. No one yelled, I'm shot. No one did anything but what they were already doing. Where were you just now? You weren't here at the front desk. I was out back eating my dinner. Why? Nothing. You happen to see that woman who just ran through here? No. Tall, dark-haired woman, about 30, wore a mixed stole? Me? Yeah. Oh, you're kidding me. This joint. No. You still looking for Joe Panny? He lives here again, doesn't he? Yeah. Have you seen him? Where is he? Out. I sat down with myself and waited a half an hour later, when the clerk went back to finish his dinner, I stepped over to the desk and borrowed his pass key and went back up the stairs to room 210. Well, I didn't need the pass key and I didn't need to doubt the clerk. Joe Penny wasn't there. But all of his things were. The curtains were drawn and the windows closed. Every drawer had been pulled out of every dresser. The mattress on the bed was slit from top to bottom, and the rug had been ripped and turned over. <laughs> Expense account, item six, one dollar, one drink. From me. I left JoJo's room, went to the nearest bar, sat down, and had a drink. A scared victim, a missing con... A dark-haired woman wearing a mink and a gun, and other things. Right then and there, I decided that Mike Can's tip had been pretty good at that. Here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Thanks. Tomorrow, a slight case of mayhem. When the right guy turns up in the wrong place. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Duff. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. This is Jules Martin. 
Lieutenant Martin? Yeah, that's right. I got a message you called while I was out and left this number. Yeah. I want to talk to you about the McCormick case, Lieutenant. McCormick? $100,000 burglary out on Long Island back in 1951. I was the officer in charge. Who are you? Insurance investigator. I got a tip that an ex-convict named Joe Panny might have pulled it. I'm at Panny's hotel. Well, let me know how you make out. Say, listen, this room's been torn apart. Every inch of it's been searched. And when I came here tonight, I got socked by a woman with a gun. Give me that address. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Allied Casualty and Insurance Company Limited, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McCormick matter. Expense account, item seven, two dollars, two drinks. For myself and Lieutenant Dules Martin, NYPD. A big swarthy man who seemed to know what he was about. Martin looked over the damage done by the unknown ransacker of Joe Panny's room, questioned the clerk who was unable to furnish any helpful information, then because Joe Panny was officially a parole violator, ordered a general pickup. They should be able to get our hands on him pretty soon, Dollar. I hope it's that easy, Lieutenant. Any reason why it shouldn't be fairly routine? No, just a feeling, I guess. I don't know. This whole matter has been flimsy. The tip was weak, but it seems to be paying off. Nothing fits, though. I don't quite get all this, Dollar. How'd you come in on this? Old Mike Cairn died up at Sing Sing two days ago. Before he went, he told me he believed Joe Panny might have pulled a McCormick burglary. It didn't seem likely then, Panny being a small-time auto thief and whatnot. But now it does, in view of what's been happening lately. Somebody sure wants something Panny might have, judging from that room. I never saw one taken apart better, an expert search job. Yeah. Hey, Lieutenant, when you pick... He's my only lead in this case, and I want to talk to him again. That's not asking too much. Now, Dollar, about this woman you saw. Pretty, about 30, dark hair, good dresser, and wore a silver mink stole. The gun she socked me with was a little one, a twenty-five or maybe thirty-two automatic. Mm-hmm. You think she might have done the searching in Joe's room? What do you think? She was flustered and upset when I bumped into her, anxious to get away from the place. And, of course, the gun in her hand. Yeah. She sound familiar to you in this neighborhood? No, no. Could be anybody. Yeah. Well, that's about it, Lieutenant. Yeah? No, I got it. Oh, thanks. I suppose you talked to McCormick, got the full story of the burglary from him. Almost first thing, yeah. Well, I remember him when it first happened. Nice enough, but strange, I thought. This business about somebody phoning the parole office ahead of you to get Joe Panny's address that stops me, though. It's hard to figure. You sure you're telling me everything? Sure, I'm sure. That part sounds crazy. Not if somebody knew I was looking for him, wanted to get him first. But who? Oh, should I? Well, we'll see what we will see. Uh, can I drop you anywhere? No, thanks. I'll walk. You let me know when you pick him up. Sure. Two days passed, and I didn't hear from Lieutenant Martin. I finally phoned in, and a supplementary had turned up no leads. Martin had men watching Joe's hotel. His former friends and acquaintances were being checked. Meanwhile, I decided to try and find out who the dark woman in the first stole had been. It seemed pretty obvious that she had just come from Joe's room that she knew him or was connected with him in some way. So once more, I combed over Joe Panny's file at headquarters, this time looking for a woman's name. The only one mentioned was an ex-wife who had divorced him six years before. Her name was Iris Carter. At the Bureau of Vital Statistics, the marriage certificate and record of divorce proceedings gave me a composite picture of an unhappy and turbulent three-year marriage. It also gave me a general description of Iris Carter that could very well fit the woman I'd seen briefly in the hallway outside Joe Panny's hotel room. There was a six-year-old address to start off. Judith? Is that you, Judith? I think that's you, Judith. No, ma'am, I'm not Eunice. How's your name? I don't know. I really don't know. Oh. Well, what do you want? I'd like to talk to the manager. I want some information. What's your name? Johnny Duff. 
What kind of information are you looking for? Are you the manager? Yes, sir, I am. Well, I'm trying to locate a woman named Iris Carter. She might have used the name Iris Panning. She was married once to a man named Joe Panning. Lived here about six years ago. Were you here then? I was. Did you know him? I did. Did you know him? Yeah. He went to jail. Does she live here now? She don't. Do you have any idea where I can find her? I don't. Well, uh, do you happen to know if she ever I worked don't want to... Just to talk to her? When did she move on? Mm, long time ago. Five years, maybe. Uh-huh. What's your business? Insurance. Oh. <laughs> Oh, nobody around here buys insurance. Oh, we don't have to go into that. If you can think of any place I might get a line on her, I'd appreciate it. It seems to me she worked at a bookstore down the street. Down what street? Out there. Block or two down that way. I think she worked there. I don't know. You can try. Thank you. I will. Why? You try. You could be happy. So tell me, do you remember what she looked like? Sort of. Yeah. Well? Oh, not as tall as I am. Nice. Pretty girl. Blonde or brunette? Dark hair. Almost black. Know any of her friends when she lived here? Mm, no. No, I couldn't tell you that. Why? Oh, I might look up one of them and ask her about her. That's all. Yeah, you ask her that this so I think she will say. <laughs> The bookstore Iris Carter Panny had worked in was as dismal as the neighborhood. The proprietor and Mrs. Olds yielded a little more helpful information than Iris Carter's former landlady. Yes, Iris had worked there for about six months. She quit almost five years before. No, she didn't know where to find it. <laughs> Expense account, item eight, one dollar and two cents lunch. I had it in a neighborhood diner called the Shovel place where Mrs. Olds said Iris Carter had frequently eaten. The restaurant manager remembered Iris vaguely. She also remembered Iris's boyfriend. I asked for a description. She did better than that. She gave me his name, occupation, and address. An old rehearsal hall two blocks away. Five-man combo working there was really putting it up. Yeah, and the minute I saw him, I knew the boy wearing the trumpet was the one I was looking for. Just good-looking and smooth enough to go with a girl Iris Carter sounded like. Okay, guys, take five. <laughs> I'm looking for Jack Lang. He promised. I'm Johnny Dollar. Could you talk a minute? That's about all I got, Mr. Dollar. The smoke? No, thanks. Oh, man. It's real tired out about this time, Dick. Yeah, imagine it does. The way you put it. Well, everybody goes on like it. It's yours. Insurance investigator. Okay. Now what? Well, I've been asking around the neighborhood, and they tell me you once knew a girl named Iris Carter, or Iris Panning. Iris Carter. Hmm. I'd like to find her and talk to her, and I thought you might be able to help me. Sure. I want to talk to her ex-husband most of all. I thought somehow she might know where to find him these days. He's in the camp. He was released three weeks ago. Hmm. Any ideas? No. I thought finding her might be a shortcut to him. I wouldn't think so. They were all washed up when I knew him. What was that? Five years ago. She hadn't seen him for over a year then. Huh? She didn't have much use for him. I don't believe. How long did you know him? No. We went together for a while while she worked at some crummy bookstore. Then she moved away and I didn't see her after that. Then she said something about going back to Ohio. You think? I don't remember. Well, let me put it this way. As far as I know, she's in no trouble. The one we want is her ex-husband. You'd be helping a lot if you could tell me where to find her. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I'm... I sure wish I did. I'd like to find her myself. Why? 
Oh, when she went with me, I... Well, it wasn't any good. I think she just walked out because she was tired of losers. Sick up to here, you know what I mean? Can't blame him. He gave her a pretty bad time. I didn't do much better. But now I got something. It's, it's a little five piece outfit. Not much, but something. I'd like to show it to her and say, Iris, this is mine. You kind of had it bad, huh? Glad as a guy like me can get it. I know I'll probably never see her again as long as I live. Well, even ever. Another one like it ever shows up. I'm going to be ready, then. Is she? No. She must have been something. Yeah. <laughs> take a look. Nice, huh? Yeah. I'll take it back. What the... About seeing her. I've seen her. When? Where? Two nights ago in the hallway outside Joe Panny's room. You sure? I'm sure. She hit me with a gun before she left. The picture he had put out of his wallet was old and well thumbed. It showed a sultry kind of face that could have been 20 or 30 or 40. A wide, frank, smiling, happy mouth. Not the kind of girl I would imagine could ever be married to a Joe Penn. But there was no doubt about it. She had been married to him, and I had seen her. On my way back to the hotel, I dropped in to check with Lieutenant Martin. Hi. Hi. Doing any good? Any lead on Joe Panny? I don't think so far. This may take longer than I thought at first. Well, I've been out looking for his ex-wife. I didn't find her, but I found a few people who knew her. She was the one at his hotel the other night. The name's Iris Pratt. You sure? Positive. I saw her picture. We better try to pick her up, too. I'll put it out right away. Fine. Well, I'll keep inside. Oh, wait a minute. Don't go. Huh? We had some action here today. Sit down. Thanks. Julian McCormick called up, reported you. He said you came out there bothering him a couple days ago. He said he doesn't want to be bothered. Well, I only talked to him to get his story on the burglary. And I told him as long as you didn't break the law, there was nothing we could do to stop you from investigating. But he didn't like it. He seemed perfectly willing to cooperate with me when I talked to him before. Yeah, well, sometimes he's rich. Excuse me. Martin here. That's right. Well, how long ago? Okay. Well, they found your boy, Joe Penny. What? Yeah. He's on his way to the morgue. Harbor Patrol picked up his body a couple of hours ago, loaded down with slugs. Some case. And that ain't all, Johnny. Huh? His feet were burnt. Now, here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Thanks. Tomorrow, a phase of this case that ought to be called the talking corpse. Well, believe me, this one said plenty. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Duff. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dillon. Frank Porter at Ally Cassidy. How's it going, kid? I don't know. You ever find Joe Penny? The Harbor Patrol found him floating around the harbor. He'd been shot and his feet were burnt. Gee whiz, tortured. Well, what can I do to help? 
Find a girl who was once married to him? Joe Panny had a wife? Yeah, she wears a mink stole these days and carries a gun. She's tied out with it somewhere. Her name's Iris Carter. Iris Carter? You met her? Just long enough to get slugged with that gun. Well, wait a minute. I'd like to get it all straight. Can I come over? I'll be here. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of a man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dalton. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Allied Casualty and Insurance Company Limited, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McCormick matter. Expense account, item 9, $14 even, secretarial services. I dictated a detailed report of the $100,000 McCormick case. I did it for two reasons. One, to make certain that Allied and the New York police were thoroughly informed of my part of the matter. And two, to review the case for my own benefit. One of the key figures, Joe Panny, was a murder victim. Attached is a copy of that report. I tried to cover as closely as possible my conversation with Mike Cairn at Sing Sing when he tipped me off that Joe Panny had something to do with the McCormick burglary of five years ago. Also, one conversation with Joe Panny, his subsequent disappearance and murder. I had a copy for Frank Porter when he showed up at my room. He read it from top to bottom. Gee whiz, Johnny, if this isn't something, you come here for Joe Panny... Looks like he did the McCormick job. Now he's dead. You stopped. What can you do? Find his wife, maybe? You're doing this at your own expense, aren't you? Oh, I think your company will pay for it in time. You have to recover the stuff. I know. You think you will? I think so, yeah. Your key man's dead. You have to start all over again. Maybe not. I don't really know whether Joe Panning was my key man or not. I still can't see a small-time auto thief working a big, slick safe burglary. Every indication is that he was the one. I know. I'd like to find that girl, Iris Carter, and talk to her about it. She's connected with it. Mm-hmm. From what you say on the paper, yeah, very much. Oh, gee whiz, I feel like a fifth wheel. I'm not helping you a bit. You know, I handled this case for the company when it first broke. I worked with Lieutenant Martin for six months on it, and we didn't turn up a thing. You're on it three or four days, and you have all kinds of action. Well, I must have stepped in at the right time. Yeah. Johnny, Mm -hmm. somebody gunned Joe Panny down. I know you like to work alone and do things your own way, but be careful if you stay on this. I get worried when somebody starts shooting. Oh, sure. I didn't get that, though. What? If I keep on this, I wouldn't let it go now if my life depended on it. I'm going to find that woman, and I'm going to find the stuff. Sure. Well, gee whiz, don't let anything happen to you. I won't. I talked some more with Frank Porter about the case. He repeated his offer in the name of Allied Casualty to help if he could. I told him I'd take it up on it if anything came up at all. He left. I was at Central Police Station ten minutes later. And five minutes after that, Lieutenant Dules Martin was calling for the medical examiner's report on Joe Penny's death. A uniformed man brought it in. Martin shoved it across the desk at me. The M.E. says Joe Panny's been dead about 48 hours or longer. 225 slugs right through the chest, penetrated both lungs, swung through the neck. It's a very neat shooting at that range. What range? Oh, at least 20 feet, maybe longer. Not many people shoot 25s that well. It's a little gun. A woman's gun. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Now, let's talk about that woman you saw around there that night. Now, you say it was Panny's ex. Yeah. Iris Carter. I don't know whether her gun was a twenty-five or thirty-two. Well, think about it. I have. Now, look, don't get sore with me. It's just that she looks like better than ever for opening this case up. I put her on an all points. (sighs) Sorry I got wrong. That's all right. Now, the enemy thinks that Panny was killed before he was dumped in the water, possibly ambushed by someone he didn't know or didn't trust. If he's right about the range, that'd fit in. Someone who knew him would do it close up. Yeah. Hey, wait. You said his feet were burnt. Yeah, I got the pictures here to prove it. Let's yeah, take a look. These are the bosses. Uh-huh. Now, 
These little burns here. No, right here. Here and here. Hmm. Then he wasn't ambushed, you say? Look, I don't know what he was. But this is the crazy part. He was already dead when this happened. No rope marks on his legs or wrists. You don't sit still for burning, no matter how tough you are. It's fascinating, huh? Someone shot him down and tried to make it look like he was tortured for information first. Cover up. He's supposed to look like he knew something or had something. And maybe he didn't know or have anything at all. Know how you feel. Lousy. If the burning was cover up, then maybe the big search of his room was cover up too, to throw us off. Uh, uh, to throw you off. Not me. I wasn't in on it then. Yeah. Well, one thing that's genuine. What's that? The corpse. <laughs> An hour and a half later, a witness was delivered to the office of Lieutenant Martin. His name was Edmund Thompson. He sold papers in the dock area. Both Martin and I looked at him twice, and I could tell both of us were doubting the credulity of anything he might have to say. Hi. Hi. My name's Martin. This is Mr. Dollar. Yes, sir. Glad to know you both. Now, would you mind telling us everything you saw the other night? Tuesday night. Yeah, it was Tuesday. Sure, why not? I saw this guy dumped in the water. We understand that. Can you tell us the circumstances? It's against the will of God. Yes, it certainly is. Against the laws of nature, too. What did you see, Mr. Thompson? I prayed for them both. You tried, Dollar? When did you pray? Right after I saw it. Yes, sir. On the street, huh? No. I was on the vacant lot. I was cutting across towards the dock. Oh. Then I see this car pull up. Long black car. A lot of chrome on it. This fellow jumps out and goes around at the back. He opens the trunk. And he pulls this other fellow out. Hoists him up and he carries him over the dock. Then he just lets him go. Then you pray. Then I prayed. I was a little too scared to do anything else. Uh, this car the man had. Long black one, a lot of cold. Sedan or coupe? What's the difference? Two seats or one seat? One seat. Happen to get the license number? Uh. All right, all right, let that go. How about the man? Can you describe him? He stood there, looked down at the water, and Started himself a cigarette. Well, what kind of a face did he have? Dark, light, a mustache. What? The devil's face. Oh, so. Now, what does that mean? The devil? Mr. Thompson, do you understand that we want to apprehend this man, that he's responsible for one man's death, and that he might harm someone else? I'll pray for him. Pray for him all. Well, how was he dressed? Didn't notice. Hat? Don't know. Coat? Don't know. But he had a long black coupe. Do you know the make? Nope. Would you know him if you saw him again? Nope. But when you saw him dump a body into the water, why didn't you notify the police? Why should I? It's police business. Let them take care of their business. I'll take care of mine. Any of you fellas got a cigarette on you? <laughs> I left Lieutenant Martin brooding over his witness and went out for a bite of dinner. When I called him later, he hadn't learned anything more, so I decided to call it a night and went back to my hotel. I found a note waiting for me from Jack Lang, the band leader friend of Iris Carter. Said he'd got a tip. She'd worked at one time at the Elmar Theater in the Bronx. If I learned anything, please let him know. He was still in love with her. Elmar Theater. I decided my night was far from over. Kick it out front if you want to look at the girl. I only want to see one. Her name's Iris Carter. Does she work here? I just told you, go buy a ticket out front. Just tell me this. Does Iris Carter work here? Is the name familiar to you? Have you ever seen her or heard of her? You give me any more trouble, or clutch, I told you, go out front. Can't you answer a simple question? I'm looking for Iris Carter. Iris Carter. You don't have to yell at me, sir. You never heard of me. What? 
Call me a cop, Gloria. Never this mind, guy's cop. Never me. mind. I'll take care of him. Come on, you. Hi, Mr. Carter. Is that what you said? Yeah. I got a change. You got to get back on in five minutes. Then I'll talk to you later. You haven't got much to say. Stick around. I'll change back to the street. Okay. I'm Gloria Ward. Who are you? Johnny Dollar. Who do you want with Iris Carter? I want to see her and tell her something. Tell me. Well, for one thing, her ex-husband's dead. What? Oh, better watch that screen. Oh. oh. Say that again. Joe Panny, her ex-husband's dead. No kidding. That's no good thumb. is really dead. Yeah. Where can I find it? She don't work here no more. She hasn't worked here in four or five years. She's dead. Well, where is she? You took over from the old man out there when you heard me mention her name. You've satisfied yourself that I'm really looking for her, so suppose Don't you... Don't with me, mister. I'm not satisfied about anything. Where is she? She's got herself married to a nice guy. Good for her. Is she in town? You sure you just want to see her and tell her Joe said... That's about it. I thought maybe she might be able to help me and the police find out who killed him. He was killed? Two days ago. They found his body today. I didn't know about that. Are you a cop? I'm an insurance investigator. And you have to see her? You want it put in writing? Don't get in the house. What I'm getting at is this. Quick change, huh? Now listen. Iris is good. You know what I mean? And she's married to a nice guy now. Want to either make her trouble? Not if she hasn't done anything wrong. Well, I can tell you she hasn't. If it does make trouble, it'd be a shame. She set up nice, and I like to see a girl set well, don't you? Certainly. Well, I haven't seen her almost since she left here, but... Well, you look like a right kind of guy. I believe you. Thanks, Gloria. She lives out in Long Island now. Her name's McCormick. Iris McCormick. By the time I said goodbye to Gloria and walked out the stage door and got out into the alley, I thought I had most of it figured. The ex-wife of an ex-con married a wealthy Long Islander named McCormick. When the honeymoon was over, the safe was robbed. Walking out that alley, I was wondering whether to phone the police or allied casualty first. Shoot me. You've been hit. No, it isn't bad. Did you see him? I didn't see nobody. The car. See the car. The one that just gunned out. Oh, the car. We had a long black coupe, a lot of chrome. A fellow didn't have his lights on. Hey, that's against the law. Hey, you need help, mister. No. No, I won't. Now, here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Thanks. Tomorrow, the end of the trail of a 38 caliber slug. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood. It's time now for Bob Bailey as Johnny Dollar. Ready with your party in Hartford, Connecticut, Mr. Dollar. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Bart. Yes? This is Johnny Dollar. Johnny, what's up? Now, listen carefully, Ed. I've just been shot. 
I... Oh, it's nothing serious. I'm backstage at the Elmar Theater in the Bronx. Johnny... I'm all right. Now, listen to me. I got a tip from old Mike Cairn, a convict, that a man named Joe Panny might have had something to do with the McCormick case a few years ago. Yes, jewelry case, $100,000. Well, Panny's been murdered. I didn't get a chance to learn anything from him. But I have learned that Panny's ex-wife is married to Julian McCormick. You've uh, contacted our New York office? I've been trying to get your man Frank Porter at his home, but no one answers. It'd be pretty nasty for Allied Casualty if she thought it was just Joe Panny to rob McCormick. Yeah. Do you want me to wait and let Frank Porter handle it? No, no, no. You go ahead. If somebody's throwing bullets around, they'd better be stopped before we... Oh, well... Why me rather than Frank Porter, huh? Okay. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Allied Casualty and Insurance Company Limited, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the McCormick matter. Item 11, seven dollars and a half, one bottle of scotch, which I sent the stage doorman out to get while I was calling Ed Barth at Allied Insurance. Apparently everybody in the neighborhood sort of thought the exchange of shots between me and somebody in a long black poop were backfires. It was the doorman who dragged me back in the theater. Uh, you got yourself a boy now, mister? Ah, uh, it's just a graze. Oh, I sure don't get you. Call an insurance people or not police. Somebody fires a gun, don't you call the cops? Have another drink. That's the way it seems to you. Hey, hey, where you going? You should see a doctor. I went back outside in the alley where the shooting had taken place. Ten minutes of looking around, and I dug a pair of 38 slugs out of a telephone post. <laughs> Expense account, item 12, $4.35, cab fare, Elmar Theater to Long Island. It was 12 o'clock straight up when I got to the McCormick home. There were no lights burning, and apparently everyone had retired for the night. I checked the garage first. A 55 Cadillac convertible and a four-year-old Jag. No warm motors, no black coops. I went to the house. Oh. It's you. Hello, Mrs. McCormick. No, no, please. Please don't come in. My husband. Oh, please. I don't know who you are, but I remember meeting you at the hotel the other day. I'm Johnny Dollar, an insurance investigator. Insurance? Oh. Well, there must be some way we can fix this up. Talk to me tomorrow. I'll meet you somewhere. How can you fix up murder? Murder? What are you talking about? Joe Panny's dead. Your ex-husband. He was shot with a twenty-five, Just like the one you swung at me at the hotel. Oh, no. <laughs> You want to tell me about that? All right, I'll tell you. Joe was your husband once. You helped him rob this house five years ago. He couldn't have done it alone. He wasn't that slick. He wasn't that good. He could steal a car, but a safe lock's different from ignition. Well? Yes. Yes, I helped him do it. He made me. He promised me if I helped him, I'd never hear from him again. I opened the safe for him. But you were down to see him at his hotel the other night. You searched his room. Searched his room? Yeah. Well, I don't know anything about that. He called me, said he wanted money. I didn't know where he'd been for these last few years. Up the river. Oh. So, he wanted money. Only he wasn't there when I went there. And I was. Yes. With a gun? I went down there to kill him. But I didn't see him. Not then. Later somewhere. I haven't seen him at all, I tell you. Just talked to him on the phone. I don't suppose it would make any difference if I told you I had a good reason. If I told you I loved my husband very much. Not likely, in view of the fact you helped your ex-husband rob him of $100,000 worth of jewelry five years ago. Oh, I can explain that. Joe came around when we got back from our honeymoon. It's an old story. My past isn't all it's... Well, I know. Joe threatened to tell my husband about it, and if I gave him money. I didn't have any, so I opened the safe for him that night. It's all I could think to do. Yeah. Then you split with him later on. I told you, I haven't seen him. Why would I want to do that? I have everything I want in life, right here. Mostly my husband. Well, it's still a police matter, Mrs. McCormick. 
I spent a long time looking for you. Maybe you better get your clothes. Iris, you remain exactly where you are. Julian. And so will you, Mr. Dollar. Julian, you heard what I said. Don't worry about it, my dear. Mr. Dollar, I'm a gentleman. But this is a gun. I noticed. I'm 38. I got a couple of slugs in my pocket that came from it. Stand over there. Now, this is pretty silly. You can put that thing away and we can settle it the only way it can be settled. My wife has told you the absolute truth, Mr. Dollar. She's innocent of any wrongdoing, so far as I'm concerned. Is that clear? It's pretty glib, McCormick. She's accessory to a $100,000 heist, and she hasn't done anything wrong. If she wanted to give them away... To an ex-husband. To anybody. That was her affair. I would not press charges. Well, that takes care of you. How are you going to square it with allied casualty in the state of New York? And you also forget a little matter of a dead man. But I haven't forgotten you, Mr. Dollar. Julian, please don't. I've caused enough trouble, please. Calm yourself, my dear. This is the least I can do for you. After what you've done for me. Just being my wife. Mr. Dollar, will you accept money? Not enough for murder. Fifty, uh, hundred thousand... I think to kill you, Mr. Dollar. You tried once tonight. You referred to that before. But you weren't very good, and now you're even worse. You forgot to take the safety off that gun. The safety! Oh, you killed him! You killed him! Ah, he's all right. Get out of the way and let me see that gun. I wasn't interested in either one of them for the moment. I was looking at the thirty-eight I'd taken from Julian McCormick. There was a smear of cosmoline still inside the barrel. I sniffed it, checked it, found all chambers loaded. It was a brand new weapon, and it had never been fired. <laughs> Expense account item 13, five dollars and a half, cab fare again, this time from Long Island to an apartment in Queens. The man I wanted to see was Allied Casualties man, Frank Porter. He lived in a very polite neighborhood. Uh, that's apartment 203, but Mr. Porter is not in, sir. I'll wait for him. Yes, sir. It's all right if I sit in your lobby, isn't it? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. But uh, I'd prefer that you waited somewhere else. He would. Well, this is a rather exclusive apartment building, sir, and we don't like people uh, loitering in the lobby. Well, I'm on a pretty exclusive mission. But uh, you don't like the mud on my clothes and the tin on my coat, huh? Are you a friend of Mr. Porter? Yeah. Good friend? He wouldn't mind if I waited in his apartment, if that's what you mean. No, sir. Impossible. But a couple of bucks can do wonders sometimes. There's quite a layout. Books, pictures, furniture, and whatnots that make living at home pretty agreeable. I propped myself up on a stool at Frank's little bar, poured myself a drink, and sat there waiting for him. I was like that a half an hour later when he showed up. He looked a little unsteady on his feet. Well, oh, she lives. Johnny Dollar. Hi. You're the last person in the world I expect to see. That light can let you in. I didn't think he'd mind. No, not at all. I tried to phone you earlier tonight. You were up. I'm sorry. She lives. What's on your mind, Johnny? I wanted to tell you I was shot at tonight. Well, I wanted to tell you I found out who Mrs. McCormick is and was. Since you were on the case first for Allied, I thought I'd tell you first. Well, she would. So this is a nice setup. All the nice things. Yeah. I've been in places like this before, Frank. They usually start at 300 or better a month. But maid service, phone service, all those things cost money. A lot of money. Don't they, Frank? Gee, Bush. When did you tumble to it, Johnny? A little while ago, when I was out on Long Island, Julian McCormick made me a proposition. He finally offered me $100,000. A lot of money. He sounded like he'd had experience making propositions. I should have tumbled to it a couple of days ago when you phoned the parole office after I left you. You used my name when you asked for Joe Panny's address. Yes. I wondered if your tip was on the right track. I didn't figure Joe Panny was eligible for parole so quick. I had to get to him before you did. He wasn't the kind to keep his mouth shut. You shut it for him, didn't you, Frank? My advice to them, sir. Now, go ahead. They'll be strapping you down one of these days. <laughs> no hundred and a half a week investigating claims. 
Friday night pitches like this. He was a lucky thing, John. When I was called to Long Island to investigate that heist five years ago, I met McCormick's wife. Recognize her as Joe Penny's ex. And you knew McCormick was in love with his wife enough to pay you to keep quiet. I gave him service for his money. The cops would have broken that case in 24 hours, but I covered up all the traps you can find. And I made it real safe by seeing Joe sent up the river. How? <laughs> he chipped off the cops to some of his hot car deal, and he picked him up. He happened to be carrying a gun, so he got the worst. Then you just sat around drawing blackmail from McCormick. Don't look at me like that, Johnny. The guy has his price. How about you? <laughs> That's the second offer I've had tonight. It's a good one. So Panny was a dumb guy. He picked up that Jew and went right down the town and punched it in the safe deposit box. Been sitting there all the time he was up the river. Still worth Sorry, it. Frank. You sure? I'm sure. Chief. Chief was Johnny, you are a good dick. You don't buy all. I just wanted to see it. Sure. Well, shall we go in quietly? You'd be surprised, Johnny, how quiet. You'd better dial for an ambulance if you want me to go to the trial. You, you were good in that alley back in the theater tonight, Johnny, when I tried to knock you off. I followed you all night looking for my chance. You didn't hit me twice. Dial a duck. Quick, quick. Gee, it hurts. He died right there, without saying another word. The disposition of the case and what to do about Frank Porter, an insurance adjuster who goes bad, is a matter I don't have to handle. And I'm glad. Expense account item 14, hotel and board in New York City, $79.30. Item 15, $84, legal fees and incidental expenses, involved in locating the widow of Mike Cairns, who it seems is still alive somewhere in Iowa, and will accept half the reward as promised. Item 16, $14 even, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $265.91. Remarks? She was. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about next week's story. Thanks. Next week, the story of a ship, the Molly K. Destination, Davy Jones' locker. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Your truly Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Mary Jane Croft, Virginia Gregg, Marvin Miller, Forrest Lewis, Frank Gerstle, Herb Butterfield, Herb Ellis, Tony Barrett, Ken Christie, Jack Crucian, and Junius Matthews. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Your truly Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> <laughs> 